the next hour, you're listening to the Classic Auto Mall podcast, broadcast from the Classic Auto Mall studio in Morgantown, Pennsylvania. Classic Auto Mall is a world-class facility conveniently located just an hour west of Philadelphia on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The building is over 336,000 square feet and is full of over 650 classics for sale and 300 barn finds on display. Check out all the inventory on the website, ClassicAutomall.com. If you have any questions for our host or guest, email us at podcast at ClassicAutomall.com. Now on to the show with our host, the president of Classic Auto Mall, Stuart Howden. Look at the crowd of people coming in. Oh, the photography club is back. Yep. The photography club is here. I forgot they were coming today. They have a wonderful time here. They mostly shoot very up close um, details of the car more than the overall car. They'll shoot like the hood ornament or a cloisonne bag. Yeah. Well, that's the biggest word I'm going to use today. Cloisonne. cloisonne. Yeah. And uh, and they're here. They come about two or three times a year. And they have their tripods. And they're just kind of wandering around. You'll see them laying on the floor, getting the perfect angle. And oh, yeah. They take really artsy shots. Really artsy, way artsier than us. I mean, what we, we we're more journeyman photographers than what we do, and we do a great job with the photography. Our guys are amazing, and of course, they have a great room to work with, the white room. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and so, but but their job is to show the detail, and yes, it's supposed to look glamorous. But it's supposed to look accurate. Right. That's really what we're looking for is accuracy and showing uh, the details and that kind of thing. And uh, that's really important for us. So First, I want to say happy birthday oh, well, thank to you. our host and president, Stuart Howden. Uh, and say, then you say hello to TikTok. <laughs> hello, yeah. TikTok. One, one How are you person. doing? Yeah. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> Um, I am 60 trips around the sun. Wow. Big yeah, one, big yeah, one. yeah, it's a big one. So, uh, but I got a nice gift that I bought myself a few weeks ago. Oh, so. you did. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's the way it is. My wife and I just can't buy each other anything anymore because it's like, oh, we just get it if we want it. And there's no reason yeah. to wait till your birthday. Or... I said my wife is, is very difficult to shop for because when she wants something, yeah, she just she buys it. it. Yeah, like, exactly. Leaves and... me nothing. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, in this day and age, why take the chance of buying something she doesn't like that she'll keep that that just because you bought it for her? Let's let's get her something she likes. Right, you know, right. so I don't know why we've digressed into this. I don't know. So. It's your birthday. Then. It's my birthday, and I can do whatever I want. And it's my show, and it's my building, and it's my bus, as my ex father in law used to say. <laughs> that was his favorite line. Mel Tillis. He'd say he'd say, uh, uh, "Get your feet off the chairs. This is my bus, boys." You know, and and he meant my bus means my building or my bus or my house or right, my car right. or whatever it was. So he was quite a character. But uh, but anyway, thanks again to the Pat Travers Band, our theme music that I'm so proud of. That I mention every week, and we're so appreciative. They were in Sellersville last week, and I don't. Did anybody go that we know? I didn't go. No, I was tied up. <laughs> Literally, or no. <laughs> I think it was that Philly Auto Show. It was period. a Sunday night. Yeah, it was a Sunday night of the Philly I had Auto Show. Had to get show. up early Monday morning. Unfortunately, somebody has to move the cars out of the convention. <laughs> yeah, center, I saw the video. I yeah, I saw the video. The bucket list of driving a Cobra in the Philadelphia Convention Center has got to be a pretty cool bucket list item. It, it was cool. I couldn't get out of first gear or the clutch. But, right. I mean, because you, you, you know, imagine getting sideways on the carpet in there. <laughs> I was I was joking with the union guys out there. I said, should I light it up? Should I light it up? <laughs> yeah. They have plastic the whole length of the yeah. convention center. Well, you know, when I was in Allentown last week, I don't know if I told you, I went to Nicola Bulgari's place. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it's an amazing place. And they have a photo booth that is um, like ours only lots bigger wow. really big yeah. and they use it for the historical vehicle association which Haggerty puts on which is basically it's documenting the history of automobiles mm. uh, the Haggerty Drivers Foundation uh, actually puts it on but it's called the Historic Vehicle Association okay. and they're they have their their headquarters if you will uh in allentown at the nicola bogari place and they had this photo booth that is absolutely fantastic the curved wall to ceiling and floor to ceiling and floor to um, wall and mm -hmm. it's just an amazing facility that uh is in the middle of nowhere that you never see but they're they're mm -hmm. they're i think at some point in time they're talking about opening this place. if you don't know nicola bogari is the from the jewelry family bogari and he's a collector of mostly american-made automobiles and he picks oddball stuff that you know he bought a 40 Chrysler four-door from us to restore. And that's just an unusual car. It's not normally 
guys with high net worth usually are collecting Duesenbergs and things like that, but he likes American cars. And he's got a private collection up there, and they've built kind of a campus up there. They have a drive-in movie, and they have a really? lodge, and they have you know, separate rooms for everything that's going on, a uh, upholstery shop, a, a metal shop, a engine shop. It's really well done. And I think the plan eventually is to open it to the public, which it deserves to be because it's almost kind of like the, the, uh, the GM Heritage Collection mm-hmm. that's not open to the public. Uh, that you end up, you know, it doesn't get shown to people, and what a shame that is. So, um, but anyway, it was a fun trip to go up there, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, more people will get to see it as time goes on. Uh, but again, uh, boy, we had a good week. We had cars rolling in like crazy. We got the coolest '70 Chevrolet C10 pickup, black. Uh, it's got the cool. I don't know what wheels are on there, but they're just cool looking mm-hmm. wheels. And it's got the 454 in it with a Saginaw four speed. Now, wow. normally you see a Muncie four speeds, right. but you don't see Saginaws. It's rust free underneath, and it's got all the documentations uh, from the restoration. And it's got, as my writer likes to say, miles deep paint. Miles deep. Remember yeah, him? Miles deep. Old Miles. 70 C10 is, is it's one such of the epic a, trucks. Yeah. And they're so hot right now. They so. are so incredibly hot. And, you know, that rust free undercarriage, what people don't realize, we always talk about, you know, people say they don't want to drive their car in the rain. And people say, well, don't you wash your car in water? Mm-hmm. And it's so water comes down on it. What's mm-hmm. the difference? Well, the difference is not the water that falls down onto the car, even though there is what they call acid rain, whatever the heck that is. But it's the undercarriage stuff. It's the driving down the road that mud and and, salt salt and different things can collect in areas where it's hard to get to and hard to clean out. And before you know it, you got rust issues. So when you see a nice, clean undercarriage, Mm -hmm. uh, you know why. So uh, beautiful C10, clean undercarriage. I also got another Mitsubishi. Uh, 3000 GT VR4, that's the twin turbo 3 liter, 300 horsepower. 300 horsepower doesn't sound like a lot anymore. It was back then. In 92, that was a lot of horsepower. It was a lot of horsepower. And uh, this one's one owner. Uh, We call them rocket ships because they're just so cool. They don't last long here, and we get... We get them for you, yeah. They're, they're, so they're, if you're in the market for one, yeah. And uh, this one's got twenty nine thousand original miles. It's got the original window sticker, all the service records, all the good stuff. So, uh, and then we got a forty nine Diamond T Model three hundred six truck with a mid engine mounted three hundred fifty. Have really? you seen this thing? No, I did not. <laughs> it's got a pneumatic tilt bed. There's another big word today. Uh-huh. And a mid mounted three hundred fifty V eight, and it's. I'm not sure why. Or <laughs> just because you can doesn't always does it, mean you should. Do wheelies? I think because it'll do wheelies and it's got power steering and power brakes, so that's important. So it'll be a little easier to drive. But uh, right. and then another beautiful '40s, uh, a '48 Buick Super convertible uh, with a body off restoration. It's beautiful red leather yeah. interior. Uh, it's got the 248 Fireball straight eight. Just a dynamite looking car. Uh, that's one of those ones that uh, is really iconic. It's a uh, Made famous from the movie Rain Man, that that body style. Um, it wasn't that car, or even doesn't even look right. like that car. But uh, just a neat car. And then another neat car that we just got in, that I think is already we got a deposit on right. already, is the '90 Rolls Royce Corniche Three convertible. Beautiful car. My goodness, and that beautiful red. Now, people say, why would you say Corniche convertible? Isn't that redundant? Mm-hmm. Isn't all Corniches convertibles? No, they weren't. They, mm-hmm. Some of the Corniches back in the day were actually hardtop coupes. But not many people realize that. But I do because I'm such an automotive expert. You live it. <laughs> No, I just happen to know certain things yeah. because they stick in the brain. I don't know why. Right. I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, it's a beautiful car, 29,000 original miles, mm-hmm. uh, one of 129, uh, the 6.75 liter V8. You know, it was funny. Rolls-Royce in the day wouldn't ever publish their horsepower. Is that right? Yeah. And they also wouldn't Because it wasn't pub- important. It right? wasn't important. It didn't matter. And they also wouldn't publish the fact that they used a General Motors transmission, the Turbo Hydromatic right, 400. Right. And that was a big kind of secret uh, from Rolls-Royce back in the day for whatever reason reason i guess they were embarrassed by it do you think what would, why would i don't know <laughs> but uh lady gaga i mean for those interested yes. had the exact same spec that she sold for charity a couple right. years ago so if I, I said i think in one of the posts if this car looks familiar it's because she had one yeah, if you're absolutely. into that kind if you're into the celebrity kind of thing <laughs> if you're into that sort of thing <laughs> but uh it's an interesting car i mean how many of them do you see in red you don't see many at all they're usually white silver yeah, cream cream black um, and they're such an iconic. It is. It's like Beverly Hills and West Palm Beach, Florida, all rolled into one. It it's is opulent. Opulent. Yeah. You are over the top. And then, of course, the the, the successor to that was the Azure. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a really cool car, the Bentley Azure. Right. And then what else? They did come out with a, another Corniche in later years. That was a 
different body style, I think, about right. five or six years ago. But, uh, yeah, Rolls-Royce. I mean, I remember in East Tennessee growing up, there was one Rolls-Royce, and <laughs> you know, within miles and miles and miles. And we were we befriended the girl who owned it. She oh, was great. from California, and she let us take it out on Friday night. Wow. And we'd pull up to a stoplight in our T-shirts and, uh, you know, listen to Van Halen, <laughs> windows down, and the guy in the Mercedes on the date would pull up next to us, and his girlfriend would be checking out our car, and you could see he was really not happy right. about that, especially those young punks driving that what are they doing driving that Rolls Royce there's you know? something else they always get attention always get attention so uh, you probably missed that one though I think that uh, more than likely that one's gonna I knew be, it wouldn't last uh, yeah I didn't think it would either uh, very unique car and unique uh, seems to be the flavor of of time anymore but um, also uh, I want to give a shout out to our friends at uh, Passport Transport my buddy Steve uh, who owns Passport Transport out of Lebanon Missouri and we saw them a couple of weeks ago and there's four clues and if you know the answer, it's the specific stock number, year, make, and model of a car that we have in inventory. And actually, I believe we have two of these. So two of these cars might qualify for this particular week's that uh, is true. Uh, uh, contest. And clue number one, something Ty Cobb, Tony Curtis, or Tom Cruise might drive. Okay. Unlikely De Tommaso involvement. Though not a Ford, sports a Thunderbird detail. Mm-hmm. Fast name, slow car. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I like that one. So the four clues for our, our, our four on the floor are something Ty Cobb, Tony Curtis, or Tom Cruise might drive, unlikely De Tommaso involvement, though not a Ford, sports a Thunderbird detail, fast name, slow car. Podcast at ClassicAutomall.com. Uh, send us your answers, and we'll send you a hat. A very cool hat uh, because we like to give cool hats out. Uh, and then, uh, real quickly, can I do the cars sold this week? Do I have nope, time for that? Don't. All righty. Well, I don't. We'll, we'll do to that. Save in... that on segment four. And when we uh, when we return, our special guest Dave Majors, uh, CEO of Meekum Auctions, will be on the line with us um, from Glendale, Arizona, I believe. So when we come back, we'll speak to Dave. And we are back with the Classic Auto Mall podcast from the studios in Morgantown, Pennsylvania. And uh, on a beautiful sunny day, hopefully for a while here anyway, with the photography club here taking pictures of all of our 700 cars. Eight, actually, 1,000 cars we have in here. We have 300 cars on display, barn finds, and then 700 cars for sale. And we've got a very special guest this morning, Mr. Dave Majors, the CEO of Meekum Auction. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. We are getting you up awfully early, but I know you're in Glendale, excited to uh, to get the auction kicked off for the big Saturdays that you all are, are well known for. But Friday was a pretty good day yesterday, I imagine. Yeah, you're right. We're we're getting ready for our fourth day here at uh, State Farm Stadium in in Glendale, Arizona, and uh, it's been a spectacular first three days of this event. And, and of course, the way the uh, the auctions grow, the the cars get a little more valuable as the days move on, and Today is going to be a great day with uh, just car after car in the million to three to four million dollar range. So it's going to be very exciting. We've been on quite a roll since uh, summer of 2020, and it looks like it's uh, it's going to continue in a record setting way here in Glendale. It's always amazing to me, or it continues to be amazing to me, the amount of wealth in this country and the fact that people, even when we hear the, you know, all the different horror stories about the economy and this and that, that the market just keeps being on our side of it, retail, and on your side of it as well. I mean, Ford GTs continue to go up in value, and and it just it's an amazing thing to watch. I'm, it's really, uh, it almost seems recession proof. I better not say that out loud too many times. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> but well, we certainly know it. It's cyclical, sure. uh, you know, if nothing else. And we've been on, the collector car market has been on quite a ride for many years. And, and even the pandemic didn't slow it down. If anything, it accelerated it. And we know someday it'll it'll cool off a, a bit. We're hoping it's not uh, real soon. And, and, you know, we're just seeing great cars come to market and, and buyers that are looking for quality. Well, I, I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, you see... What we're seeing now is the generation that collected more than one or two cars uh, coming to market. So, you know, that that's the interesting thing about it is that normally uh, the people that collected cars that were getting up to the age, uh, you know, the, the, the thinning the herd age, uh, were collecting one and two cars back in the 70s. Now you're seeing guys who have 15, 20, 30, 50, 100 cars, and uh, it's changed the dynamic of the business. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's been the backbone of this, this current ride that we've been on, you know, this trajectory is that we're seeing a lot of 
of great collections come to auction. You know, people that have that have been great stewards of beautiful cars, and you know, unfortunately, a lot of these are coming from estates sure. uh, that need to be liquidated. But um, most of what we see now, and most of the attraction, are with with collectors and collections. It's not the uh, you know the one and two cars. Right. Who came up with the idea, which was brilliant, by the way? of branding the collections, the Joe Smith collection, the Frank S- S- Smith collection. Uh, that's a brilliant thing that a lot of the other auction houses are copying now. Yeah, and, you know, it, it just makes sense because those, those collectors are very well known. And as you know, the collector car community is, uh, is a very tight-knit community. Um, everybody kind of knows everybody else. and It just makes sense from a marketing perspective to, to let the market, to let potential buyers know who the collection, you know, where it's coming from. Sure. Because that just denotes the quality of the collection. And, well, and we see that day in and day out. Sure. And I think also, too, uh, you know, there's a little ego involved in classic cars, to, to, you know, for some people. So it's always nice to see your name in lights, especially if you're not used to that. You know, if you're, <laughs> you know for those of us who've been in the business a long time, you know, we don't get starstruck as much anymore just because we're so used to seeing the famous people that come around these type of auctions. But uh, for some of the guys who, you know, might live in the Midwest, uh, to see their name on a Mecham catalog, man, that, <laughs> they can die and go to heaven. <laughs> Well, and you know, particularly as I was saying, a lot of the uh, unfortunately, a lot of the big, uh, well-known collections are coming from estates. It's it's kind of a final memorial to uh, to the collector, and you know, in front of the collector car community, where we put the name on the collection, we display it. You know, at our auctions, we we display it before the auctions. A lot of times, we'll do uh, small vignettes, either for a motor trend television show or on. On Meekum.com, uh, we produce catalogs for those auctions, so it it gives the family something to remember, sure. um, you know, their their lost loved one by, and something to remember their passion. Well, I, I'm I, we see that also here because you know. As we always say, I mean, we think there's room for everybody in the hobby, whether it's us as a classic car uh, consignment dealer or as a uh, consignment auction house or as, you know, owners of, of collections that sell. I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things that I, I think somebody said there was 25 million cars in the market and you all handle, what, 17,000 a year or something? There's plenty to yeah. go around. <laughs> I think there's plenty to go around for everybody. Well, and as, as we all know, that you know, cars come back around, too. So it's, uh, cars are no, the collector cars are no different than, than anything else you you, you buy that prize and you keep it for two or three years, and then you're kind of used to that and you're ready for something new. So you take that back and sell it at market and, and look for a new treasure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with it's it's funny with collections. I mean, we see a widow come into our place here, and, and it's an emotional time for them because this car's been part of the family or these cars have been part of the family. But what's really the worst part about it is when the husband on his, you know, last breath and laying in bed pulls his wife close to him and says, whatever you do, don't sell the Corvette for less than six. Sixty <laughs> thousand. That's a hard one to overcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, so Glendale is going on this week, and uh, how many cars in Glendale? A thousand cars or more? Yeah, we had about fifteen hundred here at Glendale, and that's the that's the most cars we've uh, we've ever brought to Glendale uh, by quite a bit, by about fifty percent. And you know that's uh, that's pretty consistent with what we've seen over the last almost two years. You know we. We left uh, Kissimmee, Florida in January, the world's largest collector car auction. We had 3,500 cars there, the most we've ever had at Kissimmee. We just, we continue to see that at at every event that we've been at since, as I said, since coming back after the pandemic in July of 2020. Sure. Uh, We've seen some shocking things in the business as of late. Uh, Haggerty's valuation to one was pretty staggering. Uh, But your Kissimmee sale, $217 million in a 10-day sale. And how many cars sold, what, 27, how many did you sell? 2,800? About 87%. You sold sold more cars in 10 days than we sold out of our 336,000 square foot (laughs) building in four years. Thank you. (laughs) Hey, good for you guys. I tell you, it was was really exciting. Every day that we, you know, we've been been going to Kissimmee for, I think it's 17, 18 years. And it's been the world's largest collector car auction for at least half of that. And, And this year, every day, set a record for that day for Kissimmee. That's so exciting. And then of course it set a record for set a record for us for Kissimmee by, you know, quite a bit and then uh, as I, I think 
think you probably saw some of our publicity. It was the first collector car auction ever to exceed two hundred million dollars in sales. So, yeah. it just it was record setting, you know, across the board. NBC was purely a make and produces content. NBC buys that content and puts it on television. That was it. With Motor Trend, it's much more collaborative. It's you know what kinds of things can we do with two iconic brands to continue to improve improve those brands across. You know, digital platforms, across print platforms, across car show platforms, television, not only the live auction, but uh, some other projects that we have in the works now to produce uh, other television collaboratively between Motor Trend and Meekin. So I think there's so much more than we can that we can do with Motor Trend now beyond just producing a live auction that they put on TV. And, and we've already started down that path with them. I think, it's, I think there's going to be a lot of exciting things come out of that relationship in the future. Well, and, and it's so popular. It's funny how popular watching an auction on television has become. You, you know, it, when I worked for eBay Cruise in 2001, 2000, back in that era, you know, we didn't think, we weren't thinking that globe or that, uh, that big, you know, we weren't thinking about the <laughs> fact that people would actually watch this on television. I mean, we were just happy that people would show up and, and come raise their hand. <laughs> but I, I, I do know, and correct me if I'm wrong, didn't originally make them kind of buy time on, on some kind of obscure television? stations just to get the ball rolling with with television well we actually started back in 2008 with uh, what was then speed vision right that became velocity and we were we were with speed vision that became velocity until uh, 2013 uh, when I came and it was we weren't buying the TV time but it wasn't a um, you know, I would say it's not a profit center sure sure it was there was, Meekum was, there was still a license fee involved, but Meekum was spending a lot more money to produce the television than the license fee was covering, and that difference was considered a marketing expense. Right. So then I came, I, I joined Meekum, I retired in 2012, and uh, uh, Dana asked me to come and, and work with him at, at Meekum, so in 2013 I came, and we were at the end of the Velocity current contract, and, and I decided that it would be a good time to see if there weren't better partners, and then that's, sure. at the end of 13 is when we moved to NBC. So, yeah, so you retired for all of a year. Way to go. I'm sure your wife was thrilled. <laughs> I didn't like it so much. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. If you're not a big golfer or a fisherman, what are you going to do, right? You know, uh, and, that's, and that is me. People say, well, what do you, you know, when you retire, you're going to go play golf. I say, no, I'm going to go play with cars. And guess what I do now? <laughs> play with cars. Absolutely. Is, is, yeah. there, is there ever a fear, Dave, of kind of showing the wizard behind the curtain uh, when doing these television shows? Was it, do you have those discussions about, you know, you, just, you don't want to always show every side of every business. You know, there are certain times that I imagine things that, you know, you don't really particularly want on te television. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I, 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 I tell our people, and, I, and when we're, you know, working on new television partners and new television contracts, we're not a documentary. <laughs> right. We, when people ask me what I do, you know, what we do for a living, what Meekum does, I tell them that we are first an entertainment company. Sure. And the way we entertain is through auctions. So when we're producing a television show, as I said, we're not there to produce a documentary. We're there to produce entertainment. So we're going to show every aspect of the business that we believe lifts the bar on from the entertainment side, not necessarily here to teach you how auctions work and how the back office works. And we do a little bit of that, but that's, that's not what people are tuning in to Absolutely watch. not. When we return, we will continue with Dave Majors uh, with us from Glendale, Arizona, at an ungodly hour of some time out there, whatever <laughs> it is out there. And we'll be back in a couple of minutes. And we are black back back with the Classic Auto Mall podcast. I am allowed to say anything I want because it's my birthday, by golly. So I'm 60, oh, happy birthday. I'm 60 years young. And uh, I only feel like 62, so <laughs> that's a good thing. We're talking. I'm getting to the point where I can't remember 60. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me that. My partner is turning 84 in in April. And he, you know, it's like getting one upped every time I say, "Well, I'm going to be 60." He goes, "Well, I'm 84." You know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, you win. So anyway, we are talking with Dave Majors, the chief executive officer of Meekum Auctions. He's with us uh, this morning from Glendale, Arizona, where they're Burning the barn again, as usual. Uh, man, last year, what, 578 million in total sales? <laughs> yeah, we actually, we, we, um, it, it's kind of an odd 
uh, relationship. But uh, our year ends one thirty one. But of course, we publish results on a calendar year basis. So sure. if we look at our at our fiscal year, we were actually right at six hundred million for wow. the year. So a billion is definitely within your sights. Well, uh, it, I would be very disappointed if we don't get there. Sure. Yeah, I, and my staff knows that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't give them the glaring billion-dollar look every once in a while, right? No. You know, it's You're a, right. it's amazing what Mecham grew from. I mean, I remember the days of Mecham in a tent with sawdust, and and you know, it was just a couple of three hundred cars, and you know, Cruise, uh, eBay Cruise, which I worked for, was was going strong, and and the timing for Mecham just had to be perfect for a lot of different reasons, for the way the market changed, for the fact that Cruise kind of imploded and went out. Of business, and then yeah. just the wealth uh, gain in this country that we're seeing. Uh, Dana Meekham uh, tells the story often about the very first Kissimmee auction, which has grown into the behemoth it is today. The, he says the first, uh, and it's, it's a true story, the first auction had 50 cars. It was in a parking lot of a laundromat, and there was a chicken coop right next to it. <laughs> And and uh, Dana has the best line for our business. You you, you had said earlier you know, that you have to pinch yourself on what this has become. And of course, often people will ask that question of of Dana. You know, Dana, did you ever think that what you started back in 1988 would grow into this? And Dana said, I always thought that. I was just waiting for the rest of you to catch up. <laughs> Well, you know, it's like my partner here at our outlet mall here in Morgantown. Some, he asked me when I first met him, he said, somebody told him I was the guy he needed to talk to about this business. He said, do you have a business plan? Oh, I said, I've had a business plan for 20 years on this. I said, you know, instead of doodling, I created a business plan in spreadsheets for a wonder one day if I could possibly have a building big enough that's now eight acres uh, under roof. If I could have this big a building, here's the business model and here's what it would do. And, of course, we got the opportunity to do it. And, uh, man, what a amazing ride it's been. But, but what you guys are doing is elevating the whole hobby. I mean, the exposure that Motor Trend Television gives to all of us in this business is immeasurable. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. well, we, just, uh, we thank everybody that's, that's involved in the, in the collector car hobby and the collector car business. It's, it's a, it's a fun ride, and there's lots of great people, as you know. Oh, I'm telling you, nothing more fun than sitting in an auction. To your left is a guy who's a blue-collar worker who's buying his first collector car. On the right, uh, to the right of you is a billionaire, and head of the, you know, head of the head of a global company. And everybody is all getting along and talking as if they're all on the same level, and they are. And that's yep. the way it should be. Good people are good people, no matter what your economic status is. Uh, and and I, I, you know, I tell, I tell people often in interviews, and there's. You know, the question will come up about celebrities and sports stars and coming to our auction. And, and you know, what do, what do you do with those people when they come to the auction? I said, you know, the funny thing is, no matter who you are, if you're Jay Leno, when you come to our auction, you're just a car guy. Right. And you're a car guy like the guy that brought his $5,000 beater. Yeah. You know, in the south. So it's we're all, as you said, we're all on the same level. Well, and and our our tagline is, and this is very true. And I've I've had conversations with my staff on this: is your pride and joy is our pride and joy. So if your pride and joy yeah. is a five thousand dollar El Camino, then by golly, so is ours. And when we take pictures and we write a description and we market your car, we do the same for a million dollar Cobra as we do for a five thousand dollar. Everybody gets the same treatment, and same with our customers. No matter if you're, you know. How wealthy or not wealthy you are does not matter to us. What matters to us is that you're a car guy and you're part of this hobby. I, I got to quit calling it hobby because it's way more than a hobby. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah. uh, but I see the growth with me. I mean, you got Indy coming up. Is that going to eclipse uh, Kissimmee? Is that the projection, or do you think it's still going to be its second to Kissimmee a little bit in terms of size and scope? Well, it's. <laughs> You know, Indy has grown by leaps and bounds, and, and it, it has exceeded uh, Kissimmee of three years ago. And the, the problem with Indy exceeding Kissimmee is Kissimmee keeps growing, <laughs> and they're, they're both growing at about the same rate. So, yeah. in, you know, Indy's pedaling really fast to catch up, but, but, but Kissimmee's pedaling just as fast as well. And so sure. we're, our consignments for Indy right now are, are on record pace. Uh, we're, we're looking at about 3,000 cars for Indy. We've expanded it to, to be nine days, so it's, it's growing into every bit of what Kissimmee is, and it's going to be exciting to see how it turns out this year. Last year was, 
was absolutely incredible. Right. And for those of you who don't know about Kissimmee, Kissimmee is basically a suburb of Orlando. Some people may not actually realize where Kissimmee is, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it, it's certainly on the map thanks to you guys. Um, you've got financial and transportation, so you guys have branched out uh, yep. into uh, other things. I mean, is it more of a convenience thing that you did it for your clients, or was it a profit center always? No, it was convenient, and and I actually, as we launched both of those businesses, I I reminded my my staff and and the people that we brought on board to do that that we're we're doing this as a service to our customers, not necessarily to make a profit. But I'm not allergic to making profit. <laughs> so that that's how they that's how it's managed. But our our thought was, and this goes back probably five or six years ago. We wanted to be able to provide every service at a Meekum auction that you as a collector would need. So we, you know, we have transportation, we have financing, uh, through our sponsorships, we have car care with the Gold Eagle 303, we have Coker Tire if you're, you know, if you're interested in tires, or need tires, and then, uh, you know, a big one always is, is insurance, sure. and we've had State Farm as one of our sponsors for many years to be able to provide that as well, and now with State Farm's new uh, relationship with Haggerty, um, we're waiting to see how that will uh, that will play out to benefit our customers as well. That could be interesting. Had you all had any relationship with Haggerty before or prior, or no? No, we hadn't because we were with uh, we'd been with State Farm, and sure. all of our sponsorships are exclusive sponsorships. So you know, we have a sponsorship with Dodge. That's an exclusive sponsorship with Meekum right. Auction for Dodge. Gotcha. So State Farm has been an exclusive sponsor, which precluded us from from working with any other uh, insurance company. Yeah, well, that makes sense, and and that's the right way to do business. You know, it's it, you can't be everybody. You can't be you know everybody's. Uh, or you can't have everybody as your master. You know, it just doesn't work that way, uh, because it's it's not fair to everybody. Because somebody gets left out in the cold usually, and you know that's no fun. So, uh, but yeah, and, and we, when we started our sponsor program, we were you know there were three goals we were trying to accomplish. One is to to be able to provide all the services for for everyone we you know for every collector car enthusiast. The second was we wanted a very well respected brands, and lastly, we we didn't want to we wanted to be exclusive. We didn't want to have you know you walk into an auction and there's you know 50 different sponsors. It's right. our sponsors and there are there are six of them. They're very special to us, and we hope that we're very special to them as well. We've every sponsor that we brought on back in. Uh, 2014, when we started that program, is still with us today. That's probably unheard of in any in any industry, would yeah. you think? I mean, that's that's remarkable. Yeah, and it's it, again that kind of goes back to what I said about Motor Trend. Our sponsorships are not just pay us money and you can show up. They've been very collaborative efforts, and we work together with each one of our sponsors on an ongoing basis to to help improve our offering, their offering, and the experience for for the collector car enthusiast as well. Not to mention the amount of exposure that they get. I mean, you couldn't purchase that amount of exposure for any amount of money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, and, and particularly in this environment, it's not only, you know, the numbers of exposure that you have, you know, the numbers of eyeballs, but these are hardcore enthusiasts as well. So yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's not like putting an ad on television on NBC <laughs> and you're hoping that the 1% of the people that are interested will watch it. It's... <laughs> All these eyeballs are interested. Yeah, it's not like like me. You know, they want to put my face on a bus bench, but I'm not sure if that'll work or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, they want to put mine on the seat. <laughs> well, you're a behind the scenes kind of guy. I mean, yeah, I, I don't recall. I've been to oh, I've been to Kissimmee a few times in the past few years, and a few others that I've seen. I haven't seen much of you around. You are you mostly behind the scenes during these events, or are you out on the floor too? Uh, I'm usually. You know, wandering around. There's lots of things going on at an auction. When I'm when I'm in the auction arena, I usually sit up with the uh, with the phone bidder folks. I right. sit up behind the phone bidders. Oh, nice. That's a good perspective, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. And and you know, kind of, I get to hear what's going on with phone bidders. Uh, you know, I can still see the auctioneers. I'm looking at the crowd and looking at the cars. So it gives me, a, um, you know, my my job at the auction is to is to have eyeballs on everything and see how we can improve it. Sure, sure, looking at an overall picture of things. And it's not always uh, easy to do when you're standing there on the block, kind of in the middle of the, the whirlwind that's going on there. Uh, certainly that's... Right, that's and that's, you know, that's Dana and Frank's... Dana and Frank are, you know, that's their realm. Sure. Dana, Dana Meekham and his son, Frank Meekham, who people see out front at the auction, and more and more even, you know, the last three or four years. Sure. 
he's kind of stepping into his own there as well. That Dana and Frank spend their days uh, away from the auction, working with collectors and and major consignments. And uh, I run the business, and that uh, you know it's been a great relationship for I think nine years now, going on nine years. Well, you got to do what you're good at, you know. I mean, that's uh, absolutely uh, what you're doing. And uh, you know, in your background, you were a CPA with uh, Country Financial, right? Correct. Yep. I was a CFO for, I was actually with uh, that, that family of companies for 37 years before I retired in the last 12 years as CFO. So that, that makes, uh, you mentioned Lee Giannone. Lee's my, uh, my confidant when I need a safe <laughs> place to go to. I can go talk to another finance guy. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You know, Lee is, is one of those guys, that, and you are too. Finance guys are usually not car guys necessarily, and both of you guys are financial background guys and heavily involved in, in car world. Are you building a collection of your own, I would imagine, right? I, uh, I, I have more than my share of cars uh, <laughs> here and there in, gar- in, in garages and storage buildings, although I'm not a, uh, I'm not necessarily an, uh, an old car guy. Sure. I tend to, I'm kind of like Lee. I like things that go fast. The late model exotics tend to, so, tend to be more my. So what's your go-to car when you, when you're walking out and it's a nice pretty day and, and no salt on the road? What do you, what, what's the one you're going to jump into? I, I have two out of my group that, um, that, you know, I scratch my head on which one I'm going to drive. I have a, a Ferrari 458. Nice. Uh, I tell you, that's that. I mean, that is the. I've, I've driven a lot of Ferraris. The four five eight is the Ferrari dream machine. Mm-hmm. It's just a. It's just a fantastic car. But I, I probably would say, you know, my my favorite is uh, a Mercedes SLS Gullwing. Oh yeah, I'm a Mercedes guy too. I have an older 06 uh, CL fifty five. Uh, the last year of the uh, coupe body style that they had that was so iconic, and I love that car. But the SLS is. Man, oh man, oh man! What a great, well balanced, uh, easy to drive. Yeah. But, you know, all the power in the world. Uh, the four fifty four fifty eight Italia is. I have a friend of mine who has one who kind of had it in the corner of his garage. He's got a Ford GT and he's got a GT three fifty and all those things. And he never really thought much about the the uh, the Ferrari until he drove it. And then he was like, "Oh my gosh." This thing's got as much power as, as anything that I own. And he was very shocked by that. I don't think he expected that. Yeah, and I, I went through the you know, the three fifty fives, the three sixties, I had a couple of four thirties and I and I always thought the four thirty was just a, an incredible car and then and then the four fifty eight came out and it that it's just leaps and bounds beyond, you know, most of what Ferrari's been able to do and it's you know, now everything's getting a little too uh, I would say um, user friendly. Yeah, you, you don't have to. You don't have to think about it as much. And you know, we're getting into electric, which you know, to me, you know, it doesn't make any noise. So that's kind of an aberration. We're <laughs> yeah, gonna have to pipe in some noise somehow, some way with that stuff. I don't, I don't yeah, know. well, a Ferrari without noise is like a Harley Davidson without noise. That's kind of the whole point. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, it's funny. Uh, the people, that's one of the things that, you know, we drive a golf cart around our building here, and one of the problems you run into is people can't hear you coming up on them. <laughs> so you have to yeah. be really careful, and I'm sure you run into that as well, too. But some of the uh, some of the sales you guys have ha- had in, in, from 21 and in the beginning of this year I mean, that are just surprisingly uh, strong, uh, the Mercury at uh, Kissimmee, the Hirohata Mercury. My goodness yeah. gracious. That had to be a shock to everybody. You know, there were so many cars at Kissimmee that were a shock, and I, I tell everybody that the one that sticks in my mind is the uh, Glacier National Park Tour Oh, bus. my God, for a million four. I was just going to mention million that. Four. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. I have a buddy who has one of those. He's like, uh, I'm going to think I'm going to need to get that out of the garage <laughs> and uh, get that down to a Mecham auction. I mean. And, you know, that, that, that is such a unique vehicle that when it, when it was consigned, and I remember talking to Frank Meekham and we were kind of scratching our head on what do you, you know, what's that going to bring? Because you just, you have no idea that it's so unique. But I can tell you that it, it was probably about four or five times what we, you know, had speculated. Well, absolutely. I mean, there are obvious ones that you sell that, uh, you know, the Shelby GT350R prototype, 3.7 million, and, and uh, the McLaren Speedtail, 3.3 3. Yeah. 3 or whatever. Those are, I mean, fairly predictable prices for those, or, or maybe a little bit, they're high on the Shelby, but everybody knew because it was a Ken Miles car, that was going to probably, you know, break the bank. And the and the Parnelli Jones uh, Big Ole last year, the Bronco, that was a... Yeah, uh, and 
<laughs> but then, but then you get. But the, you know that that Hero Hada, the Hero Hada Mercury, the George Barris car. That's another one, just like the the Glacier National Park. It's you kind of have a hard time figuring out what you think that'll bring. Right. And then for it to bring in excess of two million dollars was was really a home run right and and you know of course that's uh, that's a testament to what you guys have done too because you know for for not only for the family that that owned it to bring it to you but for wayne carini to have a part in that and to to say that you know yeah. this was the right place for the car i mean you know wayne's very well respected in this hobby and when he says something you know people pay attention and so that's a, a real feather in your guys's hat as well too yeah, I had, I had the unfortunate, and, you know, Wayne is a, is a great friend of ours, and we're a good friend of his, and he um, he and I happened to be standing together waiting to do an interview while we were in Kissimmee around that car, actually, and, you know, I, I felt like I didn't exist, because there was a line to take a picture with Wayne Green, and I thought, hey, you know, here I am, chop liver. <laughs> Welcome to my world, Dave. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's a very popular person, and rightfully so, he's just a great guy. We appreciate your listening to our show today, and don't forget, when you're in southeastern Pennsylvania, come visit us in person. We're open Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Wednesday is our late day, and we're here from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Saturdays, we're open from 9 a.m. to noon, and we are closed on Sundays. You can reach us by telephone at 888-227-0914 or via email at info at classicautomall.com. To reach the show, email us at podcast at classicautomall.com. The Classic Automall Podcast is produced by Car Smarts Media. Theme song by the Pat Travers Band.